We're on Martha's Vineyard, uh, which is an island off the south coast of Cape Cod um, in the township of Oak Bluffs. And this is property owned by the Martha's Vineyard Land Bank. Thanks to them, uh, people like myself are able to raise food crops. So um, here I've been experimenting with primarily uh, well-adapted um, Crops, most of them are, are native to, or not native, but uh, uh, cultivars commonly used in the mid-Atlantic region. Uh, for instance, the maize, uh, grain, corn, two different varieties here. Uh, the taller stuff in the background is called Hickory King, uh, probably uh, common to Virginia, open pollinated variety. This is a new one that I'm trying here called white gourd seed. Uh, so these are traditionally used for grain, hominy, uh, uh, based certainly on uh, cultivars that were found here uh, being used by the Native Americans. So the plan is I'll show you uh, some crops that I've found that have worked quite well uh, in our location here, our climate. Uh, which is, you know, really could be included in the mid-Atlantic climate. We've got sweet potatoes here. Uh, <clears throat> these are called uh, Korean purple. The tubers will have a, a purple or red skin and a, and a light colored flesh. And these are common in Asia and uh, seem to be well adapted to our climate. Uh, season's a little bit short for sweet potato, but it does work. This is called walking onion or Egyptian onion, or top-setting onion, has a lot, a lot of different names. And it grows, grows these little top sets. Sometimes they can get quite large, much larger than this. And uh, <coughs> called walking onion because as you can see, it starts to bend over at this stage. And eventually these little top sets will come down and contact the ground. In fact, these are right here. And they'll sprout and grow right there if you let them. And you can also just separate out these <clears throat> top sets by hand, stick them in the ground. This is the perfect season to do it. And then they re-sprout and make nice scallions for late fall or early spring. Super hardy plant, fantastically well adapted to our climate. <clears throat> Here's a basal bulb. So it's similar to a shallot. So this requires almost no effort on the part of the gardener. Um, example of a supremely well adapted perennial crop. It takes a very long season so it's able to really extract what it needs from the ground and the climate. Uh, this also has much higher nutrition than a typical uh, onion like you might buy in the store. Pop that in there. Weeds are really a lot more important than people realize as uh, soil restorers. This is an excellent, another excellent, well-adapted crop to, to our region, uh, usually called red Russian kale. And uh, you can see this is a pretty thriving example. And this sowed itself from an earlier crop. So this, uh, this kale I planted here maybe 12 years ago and haven't had to sow it again. It just grows and reseeds reseed something like this, although this is actually a giant red mustard. Um, and, a, and a remarkable feature of this particular so-called kale is that it's, uh, the species is reproductively isolated from the rest of the Brassica clan, which is quite important because a lot of the common naturalized weeds in North America are in the Brassica family, and so they'll cross with most of the uh, cultivated brassica plants, but they won't cross with this one. And that's how you get this true to type year after year without any spoiling of the uh, gene pool. So this is, this is the Hickory King, uh, open pollinated historical cultivar of the mid-Atlantic region. Uh, see, it's a very large, sturdy plant, grows large ears, large kernels, um, was uh, <coughs> certainly based closely on some existing cultivar that was being used by the Native Americans in the Mid-Atlantic region. And it's just 
as you can see, supremely well adapted to the climate. And um, it's very easy to save the seed. It's easy to harvest. It's relatively easy to grow. Um, so it's just a really a prime example of a uh, subsistence food crop. And then here we have, in fact, uh, some beans climbing up the plant in the classic fashion. Um, now this is vulnerable to windstorms, being such a tall plant, <clears throat> especially if you happen to get it loaded up. This is not loaded, but if it were really loaded with beans, then it gets a lot heavier. And then uh, if you do get a windstorm like a hurricane, it's all going to go down. So uh, that, that is a potential concern. But I usually get a good crop every year. Um, so of all grain crops that we could grow in our climate, this one is certainly uh, by far the easiest uh, or most feasible, let's say, <clears throat> in terms of being able to, use, to uh, consistently reproduce with very low technological means. These are uh, just common pole beans, uh, which is uh, Phaseolus vulgaris, um, both pole beans and bush beans are in that family and uh, uh, this is really a, you know just a backbone subsistence crop uh, growing on some wire trellis here and uh, unfortunately in eastern North America something called the Mexican bean beetle is a really serious pest of beans uh, and makes any serious production of them pretty difficult so uh, especially if you you know grow them year after year uh, so this year, in fact, I bought um, the predatory wasp that uh, one can buy from, it's maintained by various universities and has been used in North America since the 1960s. And uh, it's supposed to be really an excellent control of Mexican bean beetle. And uh, the fact that these beans are actually doing pretty well this late in the season means that the wasp has had some effect. So I might be able to find you a uh, find a Mexican bean beetle here. This is exactly what we want to find. This is this is the larvae of Mexican bean beetle, but it would be bright yellow if it was healthy. And this is actually mummified because it has the eggs of the predatory wasp inside of it and has been immobilized, so it's not eating the leaf as it would be. And uh, in a short time, the tiny wasps are going to hatch out of here and go on to uh, attack any other larvae that they find. So um, these beans have some damage from the beetle, but it's not severe. And so if it continues like this, we'll get a pretty good crop. There's some. Yep, so those are adult. There's an adult Mexican bean beetle, and there's actually a healthy larvae right there. And that's what, by the end of the season, you're hoping to not see any more of these. Area is sort of a, a good example of a, of a um, kind of a polyculture. So you got the tall corn and then uh, bean cages widely spaced and then in the understory we've just got some some random uh, summer squashes <coughs> growing in the limited sunlight but still enough. This is leak from last year going to seed. Uh, might be able to get leeks established here as a as a naturalized crop. And then uh, weeds just grow up quite tall in here, of course, uh, over the course of the summer. And then I just pull them or scythe them down and let them uh, make a nice mat on the soil, which is really critical for sustaining uh, moisture and active soil life. Year after year of just cutting and dropping weeds uh, has quite an effect and of course I have also introduced a lot of calcium and uh, and other minerals. <clears throat> There's a summer squash being grown for seed there. So this is the potato patch, though you wouldn't necessarily know it. Completely overrun by weeds. A bit more than, uh, than it should have been allowed, but uh, that's the way it goes. 
so an area like this they can be scythed down or <clears throat> just mature weeds like this can just be pulled out and then we just hunt around in here eventually you can find where the potato vines were super abundant but uh, I didn't use a whole lot of fertilizer on them this year <clears throat> and they also got a pretty bad attack from Colorado potato beetle another bad pest but nevertheless there is some some harvest this is probably Yukon gold you let the plant die completely before you take your tip. Yes, yes. If you want to have nice, mature, thick-skinned potatoes that will have the best chance of lasting through the winter for storage, then you have to let the vine completely die down. Again, English peas that grow very well in the spring, and it is possible to grow them again in the fall. And for instance, where you've just dug potatoes is a good place. Just throw some peas in there. And <clears throat> Get a little bit of a fall crop, put a little protection over from the sun. Sun's still hot. Peas don't like to germinate in hot soil. leeks more summer squash doing its thing more or less like a weed more top setting onions scatter them around for green onions later, rhubarb, and this is another very well adapted naturalized crop. This is parsnip, which I planted maybe six years ago and has been self-sowing since then. And uh, when they self-sow, they don't often make a nice straight root, but, but uh, they do grow quite well and you can certainly get as much parsnip as you care to eat. More beans on cages. Again, doing, doing pretty well considering the uh, level of infestation of Mexican bean beetle that there was earlier in the summer. This is all tall, heavy weeds that I scythed down yesterday. Makes a nice compost mat on the soil. <clears throat> and uh, then this can get tilled in the late fall. Actually, here's an example of bush beans that were attacked very severely by the Mexican bean beetle. And you can see the difference here. This is where there's just skeleton of leaves left in contrast to those pole beans on the cages. These have been absolutely ravaged. And that's what will happen if you don't have some kind of control.
And uh, over here, actually, we have some nice cow peas. These have done well. These will also get attacked by a Mexican bean beetle if it doesn't get under control. But, uh, these are great as a shell pea. Probably have these for dinner. Cow peas originate in Africa, unlike uh, common beans, which are from Central America. And uh, over here, in fact, is mung bean, which I grew last year and, and uh, again this year. Seems to do reasonably well, does well in really poor soil. The soil is getting increasingly poor as we go this direction. Um, I think mung bean is native to the Indian subcontinent. Some lima beans, which are starting to show some damage from the bean beetle. More sweet potatoes. More weeds. <laughs> I always leave plenty of weeds flowering because they're excellent to promote native pollinators and uh, also predatory insects that might help control the bad insects. Amaranth is a, is a big family of loads of weeds in the amaranth family. This is a cultivated amaranth. This one has a bean growing on it. And uh, so this can be used as a grain crop. And uh, unlike the, the corn or the maize, this is a grain crop that uh, will easily naturalize. So this, this was self-sown from last year. Uh, so it's... Uh, means you, would have to, you wouldn't have to use hardly any labor to get it to regrow every year, but it's a lot of labor to harvest because there's tiny, tiny seeds fill this seed head and you have to thrash them out. And then you have to clean the crop because it's full of this little flower parts. And the seeds are very, very tiny, so you need some kind of uh, machine that can really grind it into flour. That's uh, a Kubota, I think. Giant red mustard going to seed. It's a hoop house that we put up last fall to cover uh, what had been a really nice stand of the red Russian kale so that we uh, were able to get a nice big flush of spring growth. And then in late spring, I put these tomatoes in. Um, so got a lot of early tomatoes. As you can see, they've pretty much gone by. And also has other useful properties I've found when, for instance, a corn crop might be about this tall and uh, the ground is starting to really dry out with super hot June sun is baking the ground and the crop. And then purslin will start popping up and uh, quickly cover the ground and provide some shade and keep the ground from drying out so fast. And uh, I really think that uh, at least once or twice it has saved my corn crop. So, um, <clears throat> so I no longer go pulling purslin when I see it.